Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Darren Dufresne, the chair of the English department at Wichita State University. I'm joined today by Kelly Wells, Kansas native and uh, author of the new book, Fat Girl Terrestrial. Um, Kelly is a professor of creative writing at University of Alabama. And uh, in addition to her new book, she's the author of Compression Scars, a uh, collection of short fiction, um, which was the winner of the Flannery O'Connor Award, as well as the novel Skin. And uh, Kelly was uh, in town here in Wichita to read at Watermark Books for us recently, and we'll take you there now. It's called The Girl, the Wolf, the Crone. More than once, there was a soon-to-be old woman who had a loaf of bread, held it in her hand she did, and it was inconvenient to have a loaf of bread always sitting in her hands as she tried to sweep or sew or sneeze. So she said to her daughter, the one with cheeks, the appalling color of let blood, with a face like that, you haven't anything better to do, so here, take this bread off my hands. The woman said she knew a sickly wolf who would like nothing better than to receive stale bread from a girl like her. But be careful, said the girl's mother, as the woods are full of primordial women with faces like the bottom of a river and who long to feel the weight of bread in their twisted mitts once more. <coughs> the minute the woman handed the bread to the girl, her face grew dark as thunder, and she barked, Git! The girl fled with the loaf under her arm, and at the fork where everyone chooses wrongly, she saw a crusty old woman with a face like a fallen cake. And the woman yowled, you're headed the wrong way, dear heart. But I haven't chosen yet, said the girl with the objectionable cheeks. As if that mattered, muttered the woman, and for a moment her face looked like a weathered map, leading nowhere good. The girl examined the tines of the forking path and could see that in one direction the road was covered in spoons and in the other it was littered with blood sausages. The girl had always preferred spoon to sausage and so she confidently strode in that direction. The sunlight that needled its way through the branches of the forest struck the bowed bellies of the spoons, splintered in every direction, and pricked the girl's skin as she walked. She tried to brush away the light that beetled along her arms and up her throat with its sticky legs. The light, pragmatic and cowardly at heart, would not go near those cheeks, red as a carbuncle. The old woman, knowing what was expected of her, cackled. She swiftly slipped and wobbled atop the sausages and cursed herself for having forgotten to bring along a growler of beer. No matter, she'd be at the house of the ailing wolf soon enough, and then she'd have her fill, boy howdy. When she reached the house of the wolf, the cunning beldam let herself in and shook her head at the sight of him. He looked half dead already, more moth-eaten pelt than glamorous savage, not even fit to be a stole. She spit a bolus of sausage at the foot of his bed. The wolf weakly stirred at the sound. Well, I suppose I haven't any choice but to eat you, said the woman. I suppose not, said the wolf, who'd had a hunch the saving Catholicon of the bread would not make it to him in time. There is no rescuing a wolf, not in this world or any other. He unzipped his coat and dragged his body dutifully into her mouth, and the woman, who found him a little gamey, spit the bones onto the bed. From inside her belly, the wolf's muffled voice came. Take, eat, he said. This is my body, which is broken for you. Such theatrics, heavens to Betsy, thought the old woman, and she socked herself in the stomach and belched. If she ate before sundown, her meals always repeated on her. The ancienne noblesse began to undress, lace up peep toes, garter, support hose, daisy duster, crocheted shrug, ragged bonnet. A yellow cat lying curled before the hearth unwound himself sat up and said, get a load of Granny's gams, ooh-wee, hubba-hubba, then whistled like a sailor newly on leave. 
the ripe old dame, whose sister had a weakness for strays of every stripe, had had her fill of cheeky gibbs, and she booted him across the room. Then she stepped inside the wolfskin, which fit a skosh too snugly, and slipped beneath the covers. She struck a wan pose and conjured a pallor that announced she was on the verge of oblivion and should be the recipient of a steady supply of pity and bread and the affection of innocence. And just as she did, little Miss Red Cheeks knocked at the door. Allow me, said the limping Tom, who wanted to hot-foot it to a place free of irascible old Grimalkins, notorious collectors of the likes of him, and he slid out the door, sly as butter. And there the girl was, laden with spoons she'd collected along the way, a crumbling loaf, eager to be cradled in the hands of a long fallow hag under her arm. Hello, sick wolf, said the poppy, and she set the spoons and the bread upon the floor. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, lamented the wolf inside the woman, and she coughed hoarsely and slapped her chest. And the girl said, what was that? And the woman replied, my coal is, cold is leaving my snout full. And she coughed again. I have bread, said the girl, who blushed brash as an open wound, bread that has never left the hands of my mother until now, bread that can save you. I will smite the shepherd and scatter the sheep, said the wolf, and the woman poked herself hard in the gut and her stomach emitted a feeble growl. The little radish knew there was no love lost between wolf and sheep, but there wasn't a flock to be found for miles around, and she smiled at him pityingly, thinking some poor creatures are simply doomed by instinct, helpless to hallucinate more reachable goals, slave to implausible diets. She picked up two spoons and began to tap a melody on her knees, which made her legs involuntarily kick. The woman threw back the covers and exposed more fully her lupine duds. My, what big breasts you have, exclaimed the girl with cheeks like molten embers. She dropped the spoons, which landed with a tympanic plonk upon the pile. So sad when a girl goes ruddy, thought the woman, tisk. The old woman adjusted her dugs, which, raised in the wild away from the civilizing influence of braziers, were a little claustrophobic, and so tried to escape the suffocating skin of the wolf. She corralled them, and they nickered. The better to suckle you with, dear heart, said the woman. Pitiful little strawberry, thought she, whom I might once have been able to save had your mother, grr, not pinched the loaf from my withered fingers. It is always advisable to bear in mind that the embezzlement of fertility necessarily exacts a stiff tariff. Oh, wolf, what blue hair you have, said the girl. The old woman had only yesterday been to the beauty parlor and chosen a rinse the color of irises. Sprigs of hair escaped through the wolf's ears and the woman tried to tuck them back inside. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me, croaked the woman's belly. She was having a little trouble restraining her feral anatomy, and she, had a, and she put a hand to her complicated crotch and her befurred breasts and gave everything a shake and an upward tug. Oof, went her stomach. What opposable thumbs you have, wolf, <laughs> bleated the girl, who began to fear that this blue and breasted creature was not all that he seemed, this womanly wolf that smelled vaguely medicinal, giving off an odor of vitamins, blood, and moldering roses. And thumbs, he smelled of thumbs. Oh, wolf, cried the girl, your bones, your bones. She pointed at the pile. How can you heave your body from hill to dale without them? How can you properly terrorize woodland creatures with only raggedy fur and a pudding of flesh with which to spook them? Bones were an essential ingredient of both locomotion and thuggery, the girl well knew. The old woman saw now she'd left the bones in plain view on the bed, an osteological oversight, and she took up the wolf's femurs and drummed on the headboard behind her. 
If I carry them with me, said the woman, they don't poke me as much. And, well, they're uh, er, much more percussive when not swimming inside me. The woman halted the racket and could see she was straining even this rosily jowled gull's willful naivete, so necessary to the telling of stories and the entrapment of children. The girl bent to fetch the loaf of bread that she hoped would help provoke the wolf's natural canine vitality, and when she did, she spied beneath the bed the old woman's clothes. She remembered what her mother had told her, and she was relieved at the thought that there was one less old woman in the woods to worry about. She put on the old woman's shift and the old woman's shawl and the old woman's bonnet, and she clomped about in the old woman's shoes, and she pretended to scold invisible children and to dab at imaginary dewlaps with an embroidered hanky that she kept tucked beneath her wristwatch. Then she picked up the bread and crawled into bed with the wolf, who seemed to her to suffer from womanhood, the worst of all afflictions, a disease she would likely contract in time, and the wolf, quick as the flick of a lizard's tongue, quick as a badger's dander, swallowed her whole like the meat of an oyster. The old woman felt the satisfied satiety of having dined on bread and girl. The girl shimmied down the throat of the wolf, clutching the loaf to her breast, only to meet another throat on her way to the wolf's stomach, and she could see this was not the shriveled throat of a bruised peach past her prime. Only then did she realize she'd been bamboozled and was now curled inside the true wolf's boneless belly, as if waiting to be born, half wood sprite battle axe, half consumptive cur, nuts. She heard the old woman licking her fingers, and she stretched herself inside the flesh of the wolf and began to jab the old woman in the kidneys. Say, stop that, howled the old woman. Nobody likes an impudent lunch. Just then, punctual as misery, fragrant as the coming of bungled valor, there appeared at the door a huntsman. The huntsman took one look at the bloated wolf, put two and two together, crack huntsman he, and reckoned all parties worth saving were at this moment being digested. He'd been sent by the young tomato's mother to reclaim the loaf of bread, which she had decided she could not live without. The huntsman, to summon the requisite metal, lifted to his mouth the wineskin slung over his shoulder and squeezed a stream of port into his gullet. Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood, came a gauzy voice, as if from under a hidden pillow. What's that? asked the huntsman. A higher-pitched voice said, My, oh my, what a big spleen you have! And another voice, clearer but sporting an incognito hoarseness, said, The better to chide you with, lovey. And the woman, wrapped in a swaddling of wolf, let rip a musical belch, and the girl inside her immediately recognized the melody of those windy gripes, and she added to them by gasping, Grandmother! She hadn't seen her maternal grandmother for many years, not since Nana and her mother angrily parted after an argument about how best to attend to the loaf. The girl remembered the delicious wolf soup her grandmother used to make her and felt a fond stirring in her own kishkas. And the huntsman, so easily sidetracked when a quarry began to spill its guts, hastily reached a brawny fist into the wolf's maw and extracted a frumpy girl, whose cheeks were so frightfully abloom he thought she might be better off left to the vagaries of the wolf's intestines. But she held the bread in her hands, so he dropped her onto the ground. Next. With the skill and boredom of a surgeon performing his 1,000th appendectomy, he carefully plucked a quivering aspic of flesh from the throat of the wolf and decided the old woman, with her long nose and big ears, was likely beyond saving, and he dropped the slop of her onto the floor and wiped the residual goo onto his gambeson. But when thick-nailed, corn-tumored toes poked through the fur as though it were a footed sleeper a size too small, 
the huntsman reached in again with the resentful finesse of a down-on-his-luck magician who believes he's bound for a destiny far grander than the endless extraction of rabbits from hats, and he neatly skinned what turned out to be a very old woman. Ta-da! Well, fancy that. The wolf's weathered exterior, heavily trafficked of late, he could see, lay rumpled at the old woman's feet like a discarded cape, too threadbare to repair. This nested zoology made the huntsman vertiginous, and he dropped himself onto a chair. Just then, the jumble of flesh inched up the bed, enveloped the bones, then slid into the fur and got back under the covers, where he rattled a final breath and went limp with extinction. The girl, with a face like a rusted skillet, clutched the bread, and when she saw the huntsman, she went stem to stern, red as the end of the world. The huntsman took one look at the girl and thought Bolshevik, and decided no brazen-faced rose that rudolent was worth deflowering, bread or no bread, and he pumped the bladder beneath his arm and took another slug of wine. And the naked old, old crone? She smiled at the pair of them and bowed her head at the wolf, messianic with mange, who had just been alive, then inside her, then alive again, repatriated to the fatherland of his ailing skin. He'd be back, that one, sure as pokeweed. The old, old woman, much older now than when she'd arrived, a coon's age older than when she'd grudgingly passed down that loaf of bread to her daughter, picked up a sausage between her fingers and pretended to smoke it, then looked at herself in the shiny dowager's hump of a soup spoon and admired the salvaged eyesore she'd become. When I was a child, never small exactly, but budding proportionately at roughly the same languorous rate, all right in mind, if not body, as the runtiest in the world's litter, I dreamed of being kidnapped. I longed to be darling and vulnerable, the kind of child a parent would never dare leave alone, the kind of incandescent, wide-eyed moppet that would be an overwhelming temptation to all nabbers of innocence. My mother, petite as a crocus, would look at me, her lumbering sunflower, and forget my age and let me wander supermarkets, parking lots, back alleys by myself. By the time I was seven, I owned a pocket knife I was sure I could use to build a raft with scissors and bottle opener and handy toothpick and tweezers, and though I could not bring myself to special order an oversized brownie uniform with a big-headed beanie, necessary for eventually joining those generally elfin do-gooder Girl Scouts, I was a self-schooled mycologist, knew which mushrooms were deadly toadstools and which were edible. I was prepared for the daring escape that would follow the kidnapping and for the embrace of the worried adults who hadn't realized what prime cut kidnapper bait I actually was. Maybe it would be better to languish a little in the dark, windowless room the kidnapper would no doubt hold me hostage in, I thought. Too much self-sufficiency could make my plan to demonstrate my defenselessness backfire. Sometimes, when I was allowed to roam, unchaperoned, the deserted streets of Kingdom Come, I'd seek out the most sinister-looking loner I could find and sit myself down or slouch vulnerably in his vicinity, try to appear as innocent and bewildered as a hatchling, blink, blink. Once, in a small bedraggled park near my house, not a tenderloin district exactly, but close to the blood bank and so rough enough around the edges to attract an itinerant skeezix or two, I spotted a promisingly unkempt man wearing a baggy gray jumpsuit. He sported a soiled John Deere cap and laceless sneakers, and his teeth were brown with decay, didn't look like they'd put up much of a fight against steak or apples or corn on the cob. I sat in the grass not far from his bench, doing my best to appear bereft and grateful for any assistance. 
Even though I'd carefully positioned myself along the avenue of his vacant gaze, he seemed not to see me. So I got up, and after briefly loitering nearby, I decided to park myself next to him on the bench. Subtlety gets an abductee in waiting nowhere fast. Hi there, I said, already sounding fishy to my own ears. It's more difficult than you might think when beginning a conversation with a potential kidnapper to strike just the right tone so as not to scare him away. <laughs> he turned to look at me, then looked back at the park. Do you live around here? I asked, thinking I was getting confused about which part I was playing and <laughs> hoping this tinder would catch a spark soon. No response. I'm pretty far from home myself, I cleverly prompted. In fact, I'm not even sure where I am exactly. What a gift, I was hoping, he was thinking. You're in Kingdom Come, the man said without looking at me. Oh, Kingdom Come, is that near Mission Hills, I asked, thinking on my sizable feet. Mission Hills is the Silver Spoon neighborhood we made a special trip to every holiday season to see how the other half tastefully decorates their palatial estates. <laughs> it was the sort of swank purlieu in which owners of professional sports teams and greeting card moguls lived, and therefore the 14 carat burb where the most kidnappable children were to be found, those who would fetch the highest ransom. As I suspected it would, this got the man's attention, and he finally looked at me. What are you doing around here, kid, he said. I, er, was shopping with my mother for truffles, I blurted. <laughs> truffles? Good gravy, Marie. And we got separated, and somehow I uh, ended up in this park. Note to self come up with a wilier shtick, for the love of Pete, and quit being such a galumphing stumblebum. This was as far as I'd ever gotten with a would-be captor. I'm Wallace, I said. Even though I was only nine years old, I was nearly as big as this man, and I was beginning to fear he might not bite, might be on the prowl for a smaller veal cutlet. But I squeezed my eyes shut and willed him to be a bad man on the make. I imagined him cutting the clothes from my body with a rusting butcher knife, chop, chop. Imagined him holding the knife to my throat, jabbing it at my arms and stomach and legs, jab, jab, the flesh of which would give and bleed just like that of any child, tetanus storming through me. And I kept going, imagined him cutting off my hands and feet and preserving them in jars and storing them in a wunderkammer of pickled parts, imagined him recording various tortures in a crabbed scrawl on a big chief tablet before he unzipped my skin, slipped me up the middle, and my young child's blood poured forth and indelibly stained his linoleum. This is how I'd be found, a helpless girl no match for the violent brawn of nefarious men, left alone by her parents to be savaged by a furious world. Rudy, the man said, and he tipped his John Deere hat. At this, my heart sank. What self-respecting homicidal bedlamite would A, offer his name so quickly, even a fake one, and B, do so in a gentlemanly manner? It just didn't square. It's really Rudolph, he said, but friends call me Rudy. Oof, I dove headlong into the slough of despond. Where were all the eager abductors? Where, oh where, was the wicked in the world? But then I perked up, thought, friends? He's suggesting we're on familiar terms. Perhaps this is his way of winning my trust. Little girls can't talk to strangers, but they can talk to friends. Of course, cunning maniac, my spirits rallied. <laughs> like the reindeer, I asked, trying to seem like the sort of lonely child who identifies with marginalized characters. Rudy smiled, and the sad sight of his neglected teeth 
made me lose heart again, somehow made me feel like I was taking unfair advantage of an earnest mope down on his grift. Perhaps he was a reformed fiend, trying his best not to wobble off the straight and narrow. I sighed, pulled out of my pocket two wadded dollar bills and my pocket knife, and said, how much for a kidnapping? His smile sagged, come again? I want to be kidnapped. I am a willing flank stake in search of drooling wolves, I was thinking, but you flea-bitten mutts who frequent the park are so down at the heel, you can't even muster a growl. Just my rotten luck. Arf. Rudy rubbed his stubble jaw. Are you in or out? I asked. How old are you? How old do you think I am? Here it comes, the added insult. He's wondering what a big girl like me is doing trying to get snatched. Aren't you a little old for this? He's going to ask. I'd say, oh, I don't know, eight or nine? He smiled, a closed mouth smile. I eyed Rudy closely to see if he was ribbing me, but I could detect no insincerity in his tight grin. You think I'm eight or nine years old, I asked. He nodded. How old are you? Don't you think I'm a little too big to be that young? I searched his face for the telltale flicker of mockery. He shook his head. I have a girl about your size. Big girl, big sweet girl. She'll be nine tomorrow. Other gargantuan girls in the world. I knew there were, they were out there, but didn't know any personally, so I'd long suspected they might be a myth my father had manufactured to comfort me, his big, big bone daughter, his Kansas Amazon. Do you let your girl go out alone? I asked. Do you believe her size keeps her from harm? She lives with her mama now, Rudy said, but if I had her with me, I surely wouldn't let her out of my sight. Surely wouldn't, he said, and he smiled again. World ain't safe for little girls like you, full of madmen and monsters. So true, so true. I couldn't help myself. I touched his grubby grin. I took Rudy home, and my parents were gone, so I fed him oatmeal and bananas and scrambled eggs, and I gave him a toothbrush and toothpaste, the two dollars and my pocket knife. He hugged me and told me I should be more careful, little girl like me, shouldn't talk to strangers in the park. Rudy may well be the only man I've ever loved. The next day at breakfast, my mother read an article aloud, a local tragedy. Emily Lipton, age 10, disappeared yesterday from Paradise Park, the very park where I'd met Rudy. She was there with friends, and one girl saw her talking to a man on a bench. But when the girl looked back, Emily and the man were gone. They later found her brand new Red Goose Mary Janes, striped anklets tucked inside, perched on the carousel, as though it had spun too quickly and she flew out of her shoes, lofted into the ether. Emily's most distinguishing feature, said the article, is a birthmark at the base of her neck, a dime-sized stork bite, perfectly round and red. I asked my mother for the paper, and I looked at the police sketch of the mysterious man. It was not Rudy. This man sported a beard that just didn't look native to those chops, and he wore dark glasses, had clearly read a manual about suspicious-looking vagrants, and was trying to look the part. I knew Rudy would never betray me that way. But as I looked more closely at the drawing, I thought I did recognize this man. His long hair parted in the middle and flowing to his shoulders, lips full inside his beard, cheeks hollow as stones whittled smooth by water, he was a dead ringer for Jesus, for the man who played Jesus in the Passion Play, the man who hung on the cross the whole day long every Good Friday on the front lawn of Our Lady of Interminable Sorrow, gold and purple satin cloth draped along his arms, his ribs visibly heaving beneath his pale skin, dear famished coyote, dried blood trickling down his cheeks, the brambly circlet wreathing his head. 
when we drove by him slowly so we could gawk at the spectacle of suffering, not a part of the flock for whom this reenactment was staged, I always secretly longed to lick his hairless chest, bony, exposed, concealing a heart so pure, so easily crushed. And as I looked at the picture of the kidnapper who bore a striking resemblance to our local Jesus, the Jesus at whom I had once thrown a pebble to test if he was a flesh of my flesh human man or just an inflatable Jesus, he flinched and moaned in a messianic timber, but his anguished eyes stayed sealed, and I wished at that moment to be struck dead as a door knocker. I feared not even a kidnapping could save me. I gave the newspaper back to my mother and waited for her to caution me about going to that park alone. But she just smiled into her sodden cereal, turned the page of the paper, and patted me clippity-clomping, invulnerable, improbable girl, failed Girl Scout and damsel, eternal apostate stoner of suffering Jesus on the cross, she pat patted me on the arm. That was a terrific reading, Kelly. Thanks. Um, tell me a little bit about returning to Kansas. Uh, what has that been like for you this time? You're coming up from uh, Tuscaloosa, um, kind of like you're straight out of a Wallflower song. I guess you guys <laughs> had a, uh, uh, a little stop along the way, but um, what's the return trip been like so far? Uh, so far, it's great. I, it, it's very heartwarming to return to um, the place that I grew up, and I write about Kansas all the time, but I haven't lived here for quite a few years, so I'm very happy to be here. We did have um, an encounter with a Kansas sheriff on the way here, but I'm happy to say very kind. <laughs> so other than that, it's been, it's all been good. So tell me a little bit about, in the new novel, um, takes place in Kingdom Come, Kansas. Is that uh, based on an actual location or? Well, um, I think people who are familiar with Kansas City will recognize the the area that surrounds Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come is obviously invented, but um, at the at the reading, I made reference the the part that I read. I made reference to uh, Mission Hills, and so there'll be there are um, locales around Kansas City that people who are from there will recognize. Because people came up to me and said, "Oh, I knew exactly what you were talking about. I know that intersection at Warnell and 89th that you were talking about." So. The, there are places that are recognizable, but w it, it's sort of based on my my hometown or the place where I went to school. It's called Turner, Kansas. Very small. It's a p part of Kansas City, Kansas, but um, kind of in the inner inner city in in Wyandotte County. So everything, even though I, uh, my last book was um, set in what cheer Kansas, and there is actually a what cheer Iowa, and which I drove through, and I thought oh, that's such a great name. It's like what's here, what cheer? So I appropriated that name, but it's, everything is sort of always set, even with even though I changed the name and the place kind of that I'm from. And you, you've traveled around a little bit. I wanted to talk about your uh, career uh, trajectory. Um, you're the only person I know of who holds two MFA degrees, um, as well as a PhD in creative writing. Yeah. <laughs> How does one go about uh, uh, getting a couple of MFAs? Well, um, it helps if you're really aimless. That that that's the per, that's the key ingredient. Um, but I, I w what happened is I, I started as a poet. So I went to the University of Montana straight out of my BA program, um, and uh, I started as a poet. And I and I, and over the course of it's a two-year program at the University of Montana. And um, over the course of the first year, I guess I started t to write longer and longer and more narrative poems. And I thought. These are looking suspiciously not poem-like, <laughs> and so I thought I need a I need a form that will accommodate a certain girth, and the, so the poem didn't seem like the way to go. So I started writing fiction, and then at the end of that, I'd only you know been really kind of turning my attention to fiction for um, the last half of the program, and I thought I, I would like to do this again and concentrate solely on fiction, and there was this writer that I was really um, taken with at that time, whose name is Lewis Norden. Buddy Norton, and he was at the University of um, Pittsburgh. So I applied there, and I got in and got to study with Buddy, and then I just concentrated on fiction. So that's why I'm sort of excessively degreed. 
Um, and then, as you know, from there, I went on to the uh, doctoral program where I met you, and um, and I, I I did the I decided to go on to do the doctorate because I wanted to know I wanted to know more about um, who the writers were that um, I I was a descendant of, but not I wasn't knowingly a descendant of. You know, I'd inherited things, but I couldn't trace my trajectory as far back as I wanted to. So um, that was that was really my. Of course, I thought well, it might help ultimately if I. Um, want to get a job but you know at that time you may remember they that was when they started to sound the uh, death knell for creative writers getting jobs in academia you know, when I first started it was like oh they're gonna be the, there's it's gonna be a mass retirement and there'll be all of these jobs opening up and then and then you know there was the sort of corporatization of academe that's the, where they started collapsing positions together and then um, there were very few possibilities. So I, I didn't actually know whether or not I'd end up getting a teaching gigs, but it, so I thought, well, I do, want, I do want to find out sort of who I am as a writer, whether I end up getting a teaching job or not, so. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about, um, uh, though, as you went around to these different programs to be educated, um, then you took a little bit of a path as well um, professionally after that. Um, started off in Milledgeville um, home of Flannery O'Connor, um, and uh, very interesting MFA program there. And I, I, I remember you emailing me one time and saying that you were watching a fox run around in your yard. <laughs> <laughs> what was the good uh, memory? What was it like uh, being there in Milledgeville in the shadow of Flannery O'Connor? Um, she still sort of has a has a exerts a palpable. Uh, um, influence there. I mean, there's, she's sort of in the atmosphere of the town because she's just so synonymous with Milledgeville. You're an animal lover, and uh, the animals seem to be like a, they have a recurring role in your work. I'm trying to evolve in the way that I'm working with animals because I think, because I have such affection for my own personal pets that um, I have a tendency to um, sentimentalize animals in a way that I'm not entirely in favor of in fiction. <laughs> but. Uh, the way I can kind of do an end run around that is to uh, is to write fabulous fiction. So if I write something fantastically, you have to anthropomorphize animals. It's entirely allowed then, right? You have to the dogs have to talk, um, and so uh, I'm hoping that my sense of I mean I'm not entirely sure what I'm philosophically trying to say. Uh, you know, nothing particularly interesting or new about about our resemblance of the of animals and our um, needing to peaceably coexist. Yeah, animals are really um, significant and permeate the work and in the, I just finished not long ago a collection of stories called, um, that I'm calling God, the Moon, and Other Megafauna. And uh, so that, the, and it's broken up into sections and one of the sections is um, fauna. So it's, I'm, I'm not entirely, sh I, I leave it to somebody else to tell me what it all means, but they are, they're um, at least as significant as human beings, I think, in the work. The reading at Watermark, um, I was speaking to you afterward and I, it, it struck me, I think for the first time, I, I didn't really think of, of your work as uh, dark, I always think of it as funny and um, uh, lively, and I mean really about the language in a lot of ways, but. Um, particularly the, the two pieces that we heard there had a lot of darkness to them and um, some animal uh, imagery and so forth that was very sinister and, and uh, uh, as, as, as it would be with um, uh, particularly the Red Riding Hood story that you're drawing right. from there. Well, I want to talk a little bit about um, going from Milledgeville, then you went to um, Washington University, kind of a, a smarty pants academy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a school with an impressive history and uh, no doubt had uh, quite an intellectual community there with the faculty, I would imagine. Yeah, um, the thing that most excited me about joining the faculty at Wash U was the fact that um, Stanley Elkin had been there and um, Stanley Elkin, this happened this happened when I was at Montana, I guess. Um, so I, I was starting to write fiction and I was writing a kind of fiction that um, I just, I didn't have a lot of models for because at that, that was the moment of 
of Raymond Carver. He was being, s he, I think he had just died and he was being revered and celebrated and copied and imitated um, to a huge degree in the MFA community and, and rightly so. I, th I think he's an amazing writer, but, um, but I'm, I'm, I am not a good mimic of Raymond Carver. I tried, but I would write miserable stories in imitation of him. So I was writing this other kind of fiction and, and feeling a little um, bad about it, you know, that I was failing because I, w I was writing this other stuff. And, um, and I had a class in which we read um, The Making of Ashenden, which is this novella by Stanley Elkin that's about just about a guy who, um, encounters a bear and has a sort of strangely amorous encounter <laughs> with the bear and it's written in this incredibly antic style and this maximal lush language and I thought oh this is my this is the this is my country you know and um, so uh, he 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 really gave me um, license to do what I what it is that it comes naturally to me to do and uh, it was a huge kind of, it was a revelation, really. It was nothing short for me as a writer of a revelation to have happened upon him. So when I went to Wash U, and he had been, he had taught at Wash U for uh, many years, 20, 30 years. Um, he, he had died by the time that I got there. Um, so I was really excited about the, to be in this place, to walk in the halls. It's, you know, Stanley Hel Elkin had, had walked in and, um, yeah, so it was it was exciting to begin there. And so then you went from there to. And I went from there to the University of Alabama, where I am now. Which is has, has built itself into this uh, uh, very avant-garde uh, program. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. That was my attraction to it. Was that my perception is that they were specifically interested in um, literary innovation of every stripe and and. and encourage it and, uh, and we we have a really interesting community of students that we attract because they're aesthetically all over the map from um, realism to every kind of experimentation and um, all points in between uh, and so it's it's a very um, it's just a very uh, intellectually fertile and uh, aesthetically fertile and imaginatively fertile place and environment. Now that you're uh, down south, are you feeling more rooted in the south? Do you think that's something that uh, you can imagine starting to see more in your writing and in your aesthetic? I've always, I mean, I've always felt a kinship, more of a kinship with uh, southern writers, I think, uh, than any other sort of regional group of American writers. So I've always had that connection. They. I mean, this is a generalization, but they have a sort of appreciation for um, a kind of uh, everyday weirdness that I, I think I uh, gravitate to, and um, it's part of my own sensibility. And um, the thing that I find that's different about this, one of the many things that's different about the South um, coming from the Midwest is that um, they will indulge that strangeness. You know, there's, uh, you have a, a certain license to, um, to have any kind of uh, peculiar inclination or habit of dress or speech or sense of humor or collection or whatever it is. And uh, people don't really blink at it, you know. And the mid Midwest is a little more, uh, where I grew up in my experience is a little, less indulgent of that without sort of drawing attention to it as very peculiar. In, in, in the South, peculiarities are the norm, so the whole idea of what's peculiar gets complicated. And I like that, I feel a certain, uh, I do feel a certain kinship for that. I don't know that I'll ever, I don't know that you can ever feel as somebody who hasn't been raised in the South like a, you know, like a true Southerner. I'm not sure that that's that's possible. I still feel very, very Midwestern. I'm very Midwestern identified, but I do certainly have sympathies with um, Southern writing. What some other uh, influences? I had a uh, class with Catherine Jocelyn in the novel, 
And that was the first time I ever read um, George Eliot, who uh, may seem like a kind of improbable influence for me, but Middlemarch was this huge book for me. Reading that, I it had a tremendous influence on me in terms of the way that I think about um, narrative voice and um, the complexity of, um, of sort of uh, plot weaving. Not that I'm, I'm not a great plotter, but if, if I were, I'd want to be a plotter like, I'd want to look just like George Eliot if I, if I could choose. Um, and, and she gave me that book in particular, just gave me a way of thinking about how to constellate um, the complexities of a variety of human lives and psychologies um, that I hadn't, I, I just hadn't really thought about before. We also read another big book for me was um, uh, Portrait of a Lady, Henry mm -hmm. James, and Henry James is a, a stylist that I, that I love. I mean, he's, he's, Stanley Elkin says, um, less is not more, more is more, <laughs> which I obviously I, I subscribe to that aesthetically and so does Henry James. And so um, that portrait of a lady, which, you know, I, I guess that was one of the first, um, one of the first books in which that kind of um, scrutiny, that kind of light was focused on a character's interiority. The thing that we're doing still now, whether it's realism or whatever it is, but looking at so intensely and uh, privileging the interior workings of characters, um, and that so that that gave me something I didn't have before that, and something that it was another thing that kind of came naturally to me to think about um, w the peculiar um, things that people's minds do in order to rationalize or account for or um, disavow or um, blind themselves. I often think that stories, the, the engine of a story is frequently um, the thing that the character is not allowing him or herself to see. That's the precisely the thing that kind of moves it along. The thing they're invested in um, deflecting. And then that's sort of the course of the story is that, is that their ability to deflect it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Anyway, that was something that I think I sort of began to understand after reading Portrait of a Lady. Um, Juna Barnes is a big um, was was another kind of revelation when I the first time I read Nightwood and I thought and I saw that you could use this lush language and this kind of really theatrical um, comedy. I mean Stanley Elkin teaches would teaches the same lesson but you know differently. Um, that was that was another huge discovery for me, Nightwood, and you could have these sort of dark portraits, and, and it could all occupy the same space. That was that was something that um, I needed to learn at the moment when I encountered that book. So that's been a big. It's interesting because I, when you were talking about uh, Middlemarch and um, uh, James, and I mean they, these are not works that I would say have a lot of humor to them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they do have that kind of concentration that I see in your work that is not um, not really usual. I think I think since Carver, it seems like I see more and more writers. Um, if not trying to emulate that style, definitely that, that effect has carried over. I mean, we have the maximalist, mm -hmm. um, but that's more about digression, I feel like, and less about yes. concentrating on the language, concentrating on getting d just that concentration in general. Yeah. Um, those long paragraphs that are, are so cogently that's put true. together, but um, the humor, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that, that I really admire about your work. You, you described yourself, speaking of your work recently, as, as slow and methodical. <laughs> and yet, um, uh, you're talking in that email um, in terms of responding to student work uh, when you get that. I wondered at first if that also extended to your creative work, and I, I imagine it does in some way, but then um, I wondered if you could also talk about the postcards <laughs> um, a little more that um, you're doing with the promotion of uh, Fat Girl Terrestrial because that does not seem like slow and methodical. That seems like 
Right. Let's, let's knock these out. Yeah, I am trying to get snappier in my production. So uh, in an effort to do that, I hatched this idea that um, uh, I'm I if I could, well, I, I told the story of um, my colleague, Michael Martone, at a, um, we were at a faculty retreat, and he was saying that he was trying to figure out a way to get his faculty activity report, which is a bit of, you know, it's a chunk of writing that you have to do, to count as a publication. Because when we, uh, we do it online, and then at the end of it, there's a button that you have to push that says publish. And so he feels like that is an act of publication, and he should be able to use a line on his CV <laughs> to claim it. And so I, I'd been thinking, friends of mine were saying, You've got a book out, you've got to start um, Twittering, because I ha haven't until very recently. And was the idea of it just didn't, especially uh, in addition to Facebook, and it just it seemed, I don't know, it seemed too much, and it didn't appeal to me. But then I, I after Michael said that, I was thinking, well, if I could somehow co-opt Twitter into another uh, publication venue, you know, that would force me to write, not just, um, not just you know the usual, not the usual tweeted things about go to this reading and look what's happening in this corner of the literary world, which is necessary, and I'm glad it's there, and I I read that. I just didn't feel like I had a lot to that would be new to contribute to that conversation. So, but I thought if I could, y you know, sort of turn this into some some place where I'd have to churn out something that vaguely resembles creative writing, <laughs> then, I, then it might be a real spur for me. And so I, I got this idea. I'd started taking, I'd gotten a new iPhone, not the iPhone 5, I got it before that. But um, it, it has a very fine camera on it, these phones. It's kind of astonishing what these, the phones inside these cameras are able to do. And so I started taking pictures with my iPhone and they they were giving me I'd put little captions under them and um, and I thought these could be in and of themselves sort of self-contained stories together and so that that I started tweeting these um, these stories and these stories so they're one or two sentences long and I, I do like the I do like microfiction flash fiction I like I mean partly the appeal is that the, is that it does appeal to the poet in me that you have to figure out a way in this incredibly distilled manner to convey something complex and so um, so I thought if I if I tweet these stories every day or to, then I can at least have the appearance of doing some writing <laughs> because I am slow and methodical in other parts of my life and I am a, I am a very, uh, a very sort of, um, uh, very methodical reader and I'm always taking copious notes as I'm preparing a book to have a discussion in class and when I do student stories, you know, I do the usual thing, the marginalia, and um, and then the only way that I can sort of, and it's just it's just my pro my pedagogical process um, that the only way I can figure out what it is I want to say about a piece of writing is to you know write it up and first start with my reading, usually kind of globally of the story, and then start attending to issues of craft within that reading. So this is how I understand the story and. And so point of view is contributing to this reading in this way, and then on page eight, point of view does something different, and I'm no longer able to sustain that reading. And I so and then so it takes me, you know, two, three, four pages to uh, get to the place where I can talk about all of that, and that takes a while. And so I I am very slow, and methodical. So this allows me. Oh, and the postcards. So uh, at the readings, I work. Uh, giving people postcards of the book cover, and um, my partner Tom designed them, and he came up with this amazing. Um, you can you can go online and you can get stamps that have anything on them. Who knew? I didn't. So he he did, and he there the one of the things I really like about FC two that published the book um, is that I had images in the book, and they allowed me to keep them. I thought 
I had them there thinking this will never fly if this book gets published, but in fact they're allowing them to be there. And one of them is, um, is this hair um, that appears in the book. So we got a stamp with the hair on it uh, to put on the postcards, and I'm giving them out at the stamp postcards at readings and um, asking people to address the postcards to themselves, or it can be to a friend. And if they give me a one-word prompt or a, um, or a phrase, I'll write one of these very compressed stories on the postcard, and I'll send it back to them. And then I'll cool. then I and I got uh, a stack of them recently, so I feel like I'm going to have some. I have a writing project now. Have your work cut out for you. <laughs> well, aside from the postcards, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what what's next. The next project uh, will bring me back to Kansas again. Um, and uh, so I'm in the research stages of it. I w it's a novel that I've been wanting to write um, and I've had various ideas about wh what was going to be um, the primary story in the book, but um, essentially it will feature in some prominent way um, John Brown, the abolitionist who I've wanted to write about for a long time and um, then Russell Banks came out with Cloud Splitter, so I had to wait for it. Now I feel like I can, I can throw my John Brown in, and it'll, of course it'll take another 10 years anyway, so into the ring. But, um, and uh, lots of ink has been spilled on John Brown, obviously. So, um, but I'm really interested in him as a, as a Kansas icon, uh, because when I, when I was a child, we made that compulsory field trip to the Capitol, <laughs> and we saw that um, extraordinary <laughs> John Stuart Curry mural of, of him on the wall, and I was so deeply impressed as a nine-year-old girl because his, you know, hair is blowing dramatically, and um, tornadoes are bustling beneath him, and all of the other people are sort of small by comparison, and, um, and I, it just, imprinted on my mind and then I went and uh, read whatever I could about him and it's interesting he's so interesting because he's such a complicated uh, folk hero I mean it, uh, it, and he's so identified with Kansas I identity and that Kansas's sense of itself as I think um, an interest having an interesting past and being a place of, uh, of dispute um, and uh, so I'm interested in all of the, you know, bleeding Kansas and the border ruffians and um, John Brown's um, rabble rousing and uh, everything that he did. And he, uh, he he seems to have a kind of absolutely unwavering conviction about the rightness of his choices. Um, and I find this as as a deeply ambivalent and self-doubting person. I find this kind of fascinating, uh, and given the stakes of the time, at the time. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in him. Kelly Wells, appreciate you joining us and the reading and uh, Kelly's new book, Fat Girl Terrestrial, is out now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Darren.